Right, thank you very much for coming everybody uh, at this early hour and finding your way through the maze of this uh, hotel and conference centre. Uh, I'm delighted today to, uh, to be hosting an event of Policy Exchange in conjunction with Populous, uh, the research and polling company. Um, Populous uh, have launched a, uh, a new tool, uh, a new political typology that identifies the key groupings in Britain today. Uh, so some talk of strivers, some talk of the squeeze middle. Um, the Deputy Prime Minister has referred to some individuals as, uh, as alarm clock Britain. So we shall look at Rick Nye, who is the, uh, the uh, director of Populous, uh, former uh, director of the Social Market Foundation, uh, and also former director of the Conservative Research Department, um, with uh, my chairman, Danny Finkelstein. Is he? Uh, and to my left, uh, Jeremy Brown. Uh, Jeremy Brown is the Minister of State for Crime Prevention. Um, was previously Minister in the Foreign Office uh, and is also the Liberal Democrat MP for Taunton Dean. Um, before we kick off, actually, I know we haven't got a packed house yet, um, but I just wanted to do a quick show of hands because this, this event's all about the portrait of Britain and how to win at the next election. Um, and I just wanted to see how many people in this room, I know we've got a few journalists, but they can put their hands up too. How many people uh, in this room think that the, um, the Liberal Democrats, if, it was, uh, if there was no overall winner at the next election, should go into coalition with the Conservative Party? One, two, three. The Labour Party? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Hedge your bets. Hedge your bets. And shouldn't go, in, in, shouldn't go into a coalition at all. Nobody. Brilliant. Okay. I'm going to hand over to Rick. He's going to speak for sort of five, ten minutes, yes. fifteen, twenty minutes, uh, and then Jeremy is going to respond, and then we'll open up for a bit of Q and A. Well, th thanks very much, Nick. And can I just say it's, it's touching that Sky and BBC express such an interest in psychographic research, a <laughs> vindication of uh, the latest choice of my career. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because I know why you're all here, and I know it's not for me. But I just want to quickly sort of explain how we've put together this portrait of political Britain and why we've put it together. Obviously, there's a lot of talk this week, particularly when you go to the Liberal Democrats, about that coalition now it's doing, where it's going. But actually, all politics is coalition politics all of the time, I think is, is the point that I want to make. And that conventional ways of trying to divvy up the electorate simply by social grade or by gender or geography just don't work anymore. And that obviously there's a territorial battleground because that's how we elect our MPs in this country. But there's also an extremely important psychological battleground laid over the top of that, which is going to help determine who wins the next general election and how the main parties do. And what we have done uh, at Populous is basically administer a, a psychological test and divide it up the electorate into what we think are the six broad categories that best explain how people are thinking when it comes to their attitudes towards business and government, their views on inequality and social change, their belief in progress and social mobility, how they feel things are going for themselves and their families. And we've come up with these six distinct clusters because they're large enough to be looked at properly, they're different enough from one another to be meaningful, and also, I hope, you will um, agree as we go through it. They're recognisable in the real world. You can place yourself in one of these six groups or friends, colleagues, family. And just to reinforce the point about voting coalitions, if you look at these six, and I will go through them in a minute, you can see that all of the three parties have, to a greater or lesser extent, to rely on votes from each of these six categories in order to get where they're going. And currently, if you look at the latest sort of voting intention figures, this is from the middle of last week, um, so it's fresh off the, the, the press, as it were. You can see that in terms of the Liberal Democrats, of course, times are a little bit tough at the moment in terms of national polling figure, and they are drawing, as they have traditionally done, uh, support, albeit quite small support, from each of the, uh, the, the six categories. Where they have lost most ground, I think you won't be surprised since the last election, is among cosmopolitan critics, the kind of not in my name, stop the war type left vote that Charles Kennedy managed to appropriate for the party in the aftermath of the Iraq war. 
But let's look at um, these in, in a little bit more detail. You could be forgiven for thinking that there are really only ty two types of voter in, in Britain. One of which is the kind of grumpy old man votes, sort of flirts with UKIP, things ain't what they used to be, foreigners begin at Calais, all change is bad. <laughs> then at the other end, you have the sort of cosmopolitan critics, slightly younger, definitely more secular, as I say, the sort of the not in my name, stop the war. And there's a reason why the media fixates with those two, is because generally party activists, party members, and dare I say it, members of the media, tend to fall into one of those two categories. Usually actually outside the Conservatives and UKIP, towards the latter of those two categories. But what the point I'm trying to make here, though, is that collectively those two groups of voters make up less than one in five of the electorate. So all of the news print, all of the, the news coverage mm. tends to be dominated by these two groups, but they are collectively not as significant as some of these other groups I'm going to go through. For the Tories, they obviously have their problems with comfortable nostalgia, but they get quite a lot of their vote from it. But they get more of their vote from the next group, which we call optimistic contentment. They tend to be better educated on higher incomes. They're patient and prudent and tolerant, but they still think that in some ways Britain is a soft touch, particularly, and this may be pertinent today, when it comes to issues like immigration, but also when it comes to issues like benefit reform. People can get on in this country, Britain is still an opportunity society, but they think that um, some of the excesses need to be reined in. At the other end of the spectrum, where Labour tends to get more of its support, not just among cosmopolitan critics, but you also have people who are feeling under pressure. Either feeling under pressure because they're struggling to make ends meet, or feeling under pressure because they are part of a, a generation which is dependent on, on benefits and on public services, and probably comes from parents who were the same, who are sort of locked into to long-term um, dependency. Then you've got the bit in the middle. It's the largest bit, and it's the bit that everybody's after. So, Nick Clegg talks about Alarm Clock Britain, David Cameron talks about Strivers, Ed Miliband talks about um, the squeeze middle. All of that is designed to focus in on this third of the electorate. So it's one and a half times the size of the cosmopolitan critics and the comfortable nostalgias that the media is always obsessing about. And these are the people that the politicians with their rhetoric are, are trying to focus on. And how well politicians, each of the party leaders, each of the main political parties do among this group, uh, in that there is the key to the outcome of the next election. Looking at them in a little bit more detail, we've given each of these groups 22 words to describe Britain, good, bad, neutral, and here is, is, are the words that they choose most often. I think what's interesting about it is the differences between, between the various segments. First off to, to notice is the declining is there, is there across the board, right? Secondly, there's not a lot of optimism going around, except among optimistic contenders. <laughs> Third of all, which I think is an important lesson for Liberal Democrats, is that outside of cosmopolitan critics, where you're frankly not doing very well at the moment and you're unlikely to get those people back, soft touch is very important. So when there is rhetoric around immigration or rhetoric around the benefit system, that is meeting a need which isn't just defi uh, confined sorry, to to angry of Tunbridge Wells in the top left-hand corner. It is a general concern across society. Then we ask, um, post so sort of the, the, the debate in Parliament over intervention in Syria, whether people think that Britain's involvement in the world today through aid, trade, diplomacy, deploying armed forces is about right, too much, too little. You will see there a bit of the kind of the cephalogical coalition behind the people who were not very keen on um, Britain getting involved. And you can see the drivers, both the Tories on the one hand, the Tory rebels on the one hand, and, and Labour on the other. Very unpopular among some of Labour's core constituency, hard-pressed anxiety, long-term despair. Also among comfortable nostalgia as well. You can see why there was this unholy alliance to defeat the government on that issue. Mm. When it comes to Europe, you also see that really only among cosmopolitan critics is there a clear majority who are positive about the UK's membership of the European Union. For everybody else, 
it's only when you add the fact that we're better off in, even though we don't like it very much, do you get anything like the sort of the support that you're looking for in order to win a referendum if that referendum would put it. And you can see here, to leave the EU comfortable nostalgia, unsurprisingly, given how kind of UKIP it tends to be, but also among people who are alienated from politics in general, long-term despair and hard-pressed anxiety, there are clear pluralities or majorities in favour of getting out of the EU. So now that going on to the sort of more contemporary political questions, just to wrap up, who, who would make the best Prime Minister? I don't think there are any particular surprises there. Good news, I think, for the Liberal Democrats is that they are competitive among some of the hard-pressed people with Nick Clegg. So he's in fact in second place among that segment and among cosmopolitan critics who pretty much hate Tories most of the time. He doesn't do, he doesn't do that badly, but Labour obviously overwhelmingly with Ed Miliband scoring in that category. Then we ask people about the choice. We force them to choose on the one hand having a Tory government after the next election or on the other having Ed Miliband as Prime Minister and we ask them which they would choose. And in, instructively, you can see you can see how polarised most of the electorate is one way or the other, apart from this calm persistence in the middle, mm -hmm. which actually has a narrow preference for a Conservative government rather than admitted about as Prime Minister, even though Labour are in fact about 10 to a dozen points ahead mm -hmm. in voting mm -hmm. potential among that category. Then on some of these things, we, I've just broken it down because we had, we had enough numbers between people who voted Lib Dem in 2010, people who still say they vote Lib Dem, and the, and the people you've misplaced along the way, shall I say. Um, who would make the best Prime Minister? Quite interesting that among everybody who voted Liberal Democrat in 2010, there was almost a complete even split between the three party leaders. Unsurprisingly, I think among defectors, nearly half think that Ed Miliband would make the best Prime Minister, and obviously among, yeah, if they stuck with you this far, a lot of them are going to think that Nick Clegg is going to make the best president, although a third still think that Cameron would do that. And when it comes to the choice between a Tory government on the one hand and Ed Miliband as Prime Minister on the other, by two to one, Lib Dem defectors would rather have Ed Miliband as Prime Minister than the Tories in. Yes, it hurt, yes, it worked. We just asked um, people to choose between two propositions, which was standing, they stand more chance of being better off over the next few years because of the tough but necessary decisions David Cameron and the Coalition have taken over the past five years versus they stand no chance of being better off over the next few years unless there's a Labour government after the next election. <coughs> what I think is quite interesting about that is, is within calm persistence, which is your battleground, it's a dead bang on 50-50 split between those two things. Then when we ask the most likely outcome of the next election, I mean, whatever people are telling pollsters about how many of them will vote Liberal Democrat, one thing I think you have managed to do, you may have not have been able to make people love the concept of coalition politics and coalition government, but what you have done is managed to make people expect mm -hmm. that, and be comfortable with the fact that there will be one. So in this slide, any, anywhere between a quarter and almost a half think that the Liberal Democrats will play some form of role in government after the next election, depending on which voter group they're in. And finally, if you look once again at that split among um, Lib Dem voters, current and past, you'll see that among the people that you've lost, yes it hurt, yes it worked, that's rejected by more than two to one, whereas among the current voters it's obviously accepted by almost three to one. And when it comes to the outcome of the next election, however, whether you're still a Liberal Democrat, used to be a Liberal Democrat, you've been lost along the way, there are still large numbers, over half, expect the Liberal Democrats to play a role at the next election. So you want to do this and see which, which, sec which um, voting segment you fall into, either snap the QR code, it'll take you to the website, or else, if you're more old fashioned, you can type it in, I'll answer a few of our questions, um, and you'll be able to see whether you're a grumpy old man, <laughs> or whether you're a cosmopolitan critic. Um, but now, I think, over to the main event. Yeah, thank you very much, Rick. Um, I actually did take the test uh, last week, and I'm an optimistic contentment. Maybe not, so, uh, uh, maybe not, uh, nine, uh, maybe not uh, nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, right? there'll, be, there'll be a support <laughs> to <laughs> Have you taken the test yet, Jeremy? Over to you, Jeremy. Um, well, 
just a, a few sort of thoughts and reflections on what was a fascinating presentation. Thank you very much, both of you, for um, coming to our conference and, and making the presentation. Um, pick up on a few, in a slightly sort of, uh, well, as we went through them in sort of chronological order, but not particularly in order of, of significance. Um, I thought the point about uh, all parties being coalitions, about elections being about welding together coalitions of interest, is a point well made. Sometimes people talk about this government as if it were the first uh, coalition uh, since the Second World War. But uh, any party, any government that's supported by both Tony Blair and Tony Benn seems to me is a, is a coalition as well. There are conflicting interests, there are um, groupings within all the political parties. In a way, uh, the question is, do you want them to be submerged or do you want them to be transparent? I think quite a lot of people uh, quite like um, seeing the coalition uh, working in a way that is more obvious to them than, than perhaps the Blair-Brown coalition, which uh, rumbled under the surface and only broke out occasionally in hostile media briefings. In terms of the sort of Lib Dems appeal, I'm, I'm quite clear in my own mind, although this is quite an unsentimental uh, observation, that we have to think about what our electoral coalition is for 2015, rather than spending a lot of time looking over our shoulder at what our electoral coalition was in 2010. Because I don't think you can uh, reassemble a coalition based on people voting for you uh, with a track record of not having been in government for 75 or 80 years, when you have been in government for five years and have a record to defend. And I think there are two types of people, broadly put, who uh, voted for the Liberal Democrats uh, in 2010, but are unsympathetic uh, to us now, and we will be hard pressed to win over in significant numbers. And they're represented in the, in the last category, the metropolitan critics. Uh, the first of those groups are the people who are left of Labour. In other words, they, they abandoned Labour because they didn't think the Labour Party was socialist enough, uh, particularly under Tony Blair's leadership. I think it's very difficult for us to demonstrate that we are more socialist than an Ed Miliband-led Labour Party, even if we wish to demonstrate that, which I don't wish to demonstrate. And I think even if we did wish to demonstrate it, doing it in coalition with the Conservatives would be uh, even harder still. So that, for me, that group is, uh, is, is going to be hard to uh, placate uh, and even harder to woo. And then there's another grouping of people uh, who voted for us because we represented a none of the above option. Uh, in fact, oddly, most people like the idea of voting for a party they think can get in, but there is a significant minority of people who like voting for a party that they think won't get in um, because it absolves them of any blame when that party in government makes decisions which they feel uncomfortable with. So we can't make a pitch to people that we are a plague on all of the houses of the parties that govern this country because, of course, we've been uh, in government or would have been in government for uh, five years in 2015. So the task for us is, if you like, to sort of boil it down, is how can we replace the people who uh, voted for us because they thought we would never get in with the people who didn't vote for us because they thought we'd never get in. In other words, there's a group of people who I think are lost to us because they no longer see us as a vehicle for protest. But I think there is a potential grouping of people, uh, and those are the ones represented in that sort of hard pressed middle group, even right up to the, the second of your categories, if I'm the green one, yes. um, who are potentially willing to entertain the idea of voting Liberal Democrat in a way that they may not have been when we were seen as a party uh, of cosmopolitan critics uh, that never got in and were never actually able to deliver uh, practical policy implementation. And that really takes me to my sort of uh, final observation before we have a more general conversation, which is a sort of Reagan-esque expression of silent majority. But I think it is interesting that the comfortable nostalgia, which is uh, strongly represented in newspaper columnist land, and cosmopolitan critics, which is also extremely strongly represented in newspaper, um, dominate the political debate. I think, I think partly because they are strongly represented in the media, but also partly because uh, the extremes of a debate make for a more compelling clash quite often than the subtleties of the more central ground. But it is nevertheless interesting that those two groups, you might think all British uh, political discourse was a shouting match between those two, uh, particularly on sort of touchstone issues uh, that get to people's sort of gut instincts, not necessarily just the economy, but uh, issues of identity. 
that actually they only represent 18% of the total population and uh, we are unlikely to poll very much uh, or very strongly in either of those. But there is a big 82% in the middle and I, I'm struck in, in my constituency and elsewhere that I think there is a, a greater popularity, the coalition is more popular uh, than I think some received uh, wisdom in commentary circles would have it because the commentators disproportionately come from the comfortable nostalgia and, and cosmopolitan critics who instinctively dislike the sort of compromises and what they may see as the centrism of the coalition. But if you go and talk to people who don't have newspaper columns and don't tend to write to MPs in such large numbers uh, in the calm system, optimistic contentment, how oppressed anxiety, quite a lot of them recognise, uh, maybe with a degree of reluctance, I think, that the coalition is making necessary decisions which will uh, put the country on a more sustainable long-term footing. And there's an audience to be one for us there. And I think that pretty much uh, sums up really the themes of our conference, including the economy debate, which starts in half an hour, which is about the Lib Dems showing uh, a combination of uh, economic resolve and enlightened social attitudes. And we hope that that is a combination which will resonate uh, with people in those categories of voters that are most likely to vote with us and in my view will also represent a good direction of travel for the country to take post-2015. Thanks Jeremy. Um, before I open it up to the floor, I'm just going to abuse my position as the chair to <laughs> kick off the Q&A. Um, the Liberal Democrats are renowned for their local campaigning. Um, I mean, does that, do you think, and this is to both Rick and Jeremy, do you think that puts your party almost in a better position to target specific types of voters that populists have identified, um, depending on the location of that constituency and the makeup of that vote, or is that purely cynical and it, it, would, it would sort of put off a number of those voters actually if you were seen to be too um, prescribed? Possibly, I mean, <clears throat> well, let me make two observations. They might slightly sort of. Uh, um, uh, conflict with each other, but that doesn't necessarily mean they don't have, both have some truth in them. One is, I think, in quite a few areas, the Lib Dems, in their own seats, are able to appeal across all six of those areas, whereas our national appeal for somebody who um, doesn't live in an area where the Lib Dems have a ground presence is much more confined to ideological niches. In other words, I think in quite a lot of Lib Dem held seats, people who you might think would not feel that comfortable with us, would recognise the hard work of the MP, would have had personal contact with the MP, would feel a degree of, um, of uh, commitment to that uh, individual, and may as a result uh, form a, a view of the Lib Dems, which is out of line with the majority of people within their category. And even in the sort of comfortable nostalgia and cosmopolitan critics, there is some support for the Lib Dems, mm -hmm. and my suspicion is that that is disproportionately from Lib Dem held seats, if you do the polling. Um, um, and the other point I'd make is I suspect that also quite a lot of the people who are good categories for the Lib Dems uh, live in disproportionately large numbers in the parts of the country where the Lib Dems uh, have traditionally been stronger. And, uh, you know, if, if, I, if I'm, um, you know, looking at, uh, at the voter profile of my constituency, of course, you know, there are people of all backgrounds and all views in every constituency, but I think... Um, but I, you know, calm persistence may be quite a good, accurate uh, summary of uh, of the psychology of a lot of people of, from Somerset who have a sort of not necessarily a, they're not sort of a, uh, most of them have sort of a flashy cosmopolitan uh, instincts. They um, they recognise, I think, that the coalition is um, is uh, taking us necessary measures in a, in a way which uh, which the country needs to undertake, and they recognise the Liberal Democrats play a significant part in that. And, um, and uh, maybe it's no coincidence that it's in those parts of the country where the Liberal Democrats have traditionally been strongest. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the, um, I mean, Michael Ashcroft published some um, battleground polling yesterday, I think. What you will see, and I, and I suspect also in Jeremy's seats as well, is, well, you know, cosmopolitan critics may feel that the, um, the Liberal Democrats have betrayed them horribly, but if the choice that you present them at the next election is between the Conservative MP supporting or making a Conservative government more likely and returning Jeremy as a Liberal Democrat MP, the Cosmopolitan critics are going to vote tactically, if not out of conviction, for Liberal Democrats in those seats where 
the Liberal Democrats are battling the Conservatives. So I think, I think the key is to try and come up with something which is coherent. It can be differentiated. I think the <laughs> idea that you can't or you shouldn't talk to different people about different things depending on what concerns them is, is facile. Because actually, at the end of the day, it's about them. It's not about mm. you. So if you want to talk about the tough and necessary action you've taken and key in on optimistic contentment, I think that is perfectly consistent with talking about how, if you're a Liberal Democrat, you know, you've raised the threshold um, for paying income tax to £10,000 to hard-pressed anxiety. It's only when you come up with messages which directly conflict mm. that you become seen lacking in principle or opportunistic. Mm. Okay. Um, I'm going to open up to the floor for some questions, if we have any. Yes, the lady over there at the back. Um, hey, thanks for being from Haven. Um, none of these categories, uh, first of all, I should apologise for being late. Um, the subway wasn't working, the trains were late, anyway. Um, right, none of these categories really match the profile of my ward. Um, when I looked at the marked up registers, I found that there were a lot of people coming out who were voting for the first time in 10 years, probably who hadn't ever voted before, and UKIP swept through and took a county council seat, which should have been ours. Um, Conservatives just got held on to theirs. And that, you know, the angry thing that we get sometimes on the doorstep, so to me, doesn't fit with any of those categories in my former Labour uh, stronghold, a very strong, very deprived council estate. Can you describe the feeling of individuals within that constituency? I mean, are there any words that were up in those six boxes that you think, I mean, are they negative towards politicians I, 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 in general? It's angry, I angry. think. Um, um, and, and I was quite surprised that that was so small and so infrequently mentioned. Well, I think the point is, is that anger and disconnection from the traditional political processes or anger at every politician because none of them tell the truth, so they're all hide bound by political correctness, etc. etc. <coughs> what you see from this slide actually is yes, UKIP gets a lot of its support, they're the purple here, from the sort of grumpy old men and angry of Tunbridge Wells in couple nostalgia. But they're also drawing <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah they're, this is what's this is what's taking them from a sort of inconvenience for the Conservatives into something potentially more potent is that they are drawing mm. support from people who are who are either feeling desperate or anxious. Mm. Yeah. They're not the same types of people and that's where their coalition is coming from. Now, depending on what part of the country you're in or what ward you're in, will depend on whether you have lots of sort of grumpy but comfortably off, mainly male people, or whether you'll have people who are anxious, desperate, disconnected. But, but UKIP is drawing from both well, yeah. of those. And, and in groups. some some cases, it's quite interesting, UKIP sports in May, uh, wards which have both of those, which might have been seen as a Conservative Labour clash or Conservative Lib Dem mm -hmm. clash, and UKIP drawing sufficiently heavily from both sides. Yes. They sort of came through the middle. And yet the ward doesn't have a, a, a voter profile that matches one of those categories, but it may be in category one, four, and five, and therefore UKIP are mm -hmm. drawing on all their four strongest categories, or their three strongest categories in that particular area. But what struck me particularly was the fact that it was people who had not voted. And because we're so short of people, we have recently been only calling on people who have a voting record. So we missed out on <coughs> That's interesting. people. But I was going to in, in the county council elections in my constituency in May, um, where the Lib Dems made net gains, just in case anybody was wondering. Um, <laughs> Uh, we have more county councils than all the other parties put together, in case anyone was wondering. UKIP didn't win any, but <laughs> of the 11, of the 11 uh, county council seats, <coughs> I thought two things were really interesting about UKIP's performance. One is that they finished second in three of the 11, and the, the three they finished second in were the three areas that you might most associate traditionally with being a sort of working class yeah. council estate mm -hmm. yeah. areas. They weren't... Um, they weren't the, you know, the rural parts, because my constituency is part town and part rural. I thought the other interesting thing about UKIP's performance was they were incredibly consistent, much more than any other party. They got about 20% everywhere in, in, in my constituency. And the reason they finished second in, in the, um, in the uh, if you like, the more sort of working class areas is because the Tories are not capable of getting 
as much as 20% in those areas, rather than because UKIP polled higher in those areas, actually. Um, whereas in, in, the, in the rural areas, both the Lib Dems and the Tories were able to clear 20% and UKIP were left in, in third place. Um, but their support was much, much more even um, uh, than, but I, I don't have, uh, I suspect I'm, seen polling in my area. Cosmopolitan critics have zero support for UKIP there, but um, not the so many Cosmopolitan critics, I suspect, yeah. no. so yeah. Thank you. Gentlemen. Yeah. Yes, Galango from Asia and Walton. Uh, I, I don't know, um, I just feel that this may be slightly over-sophisticated, this whole thing, because I would put those, all those middle bands, optimistic, calm, hard rest, long term, into one basket and call it the disorientated middle. Because uh, having canvassed thousand uh, voters in May, <laughs> I did my own study of them, and, uh, and uh, there's an awful lot of people who are just saying, give us a vision, give, give, give us where we're going, <coughs> what, 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 what is the destination, hmm. tell us. And people are quite a lot more receptive to a vision than, than what you think. The year before, there were a lot of angry old men and young men, uh, but, uh, but the anger had uh, evaporated to a large degree. And now it was more mm. a question of, I'm disorientated, tell me, where are we going? Well, we are, my ward is a, is a sort of um, people's republic within the, the very blue Surrey. They refer to us as People's Republic, my <laughs> one. And, and of course, it's not representative of Surrey or Elmbridge, but, um, <laughs> which is very blue indeed. But it's interesting that, that that is a case in point. People are asking for a vision, and that really takes me uh, in, into uh, looking at 2015, rather than looking back, let's look forward. What is the proposition that we put to them? Yeah. And, and as an ex-admin, I can say that it's not a list of achievements, because that's not how advertising and marketing works, mm -hmm. a long list of achievements. What is the vision, the single-minded, yeah. the memorable, the credible, the ownable space or thought or, or, or destination? And, uh, and I, think, I think it appeals across, um, across all those categories, really, if there was one. So, so yeah. that's really what Jeremy. What, Absolutely. What, what, how, is it emerging mm -hmm. that, that 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 big idea, that big honourable idea from from our debates and your debates? Well, we are two quick uh, elements in answer. I think Rick may wish to discuss his own model uh, more than me discussing it for him. I think I think if you're going to amalgamate two categories, there is a case for amalgamating the hard pressed anxiety and the long term despair. And in that in that bar chart you were just looking at they are the ones that are closest together comfortably in terms of voter preference. But I do think there is a distinction between them and the calm persistence in this model. And I you know, find that the, the calm persistence, I suppose, you'd summarise as people who, uh, who um, uh, are not necessarily particularly optimistic and they are almost certainly not particularly affluent, but they do have a sort of uh, acceptance that there is a long road out of a difficult and debt-ridden situation that we need to tread. And rather than just raging at the government for going down that path, they have a sort of reluctant acceptance that it is uh, mm. necessary. Whereas it is harder in my experience to convince some of the people in the yellow and red category in this chart that that is a necessary path to go down. But I do agree, I do agree with your, your wider point. I think the mood of the uh, electorate is different than it was in 2011, even 2012. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in 2015, people, um, uh, well, we have, to, we have to make sure that people realise that the job isn't done. I mean, we are still borrowing a huge amount of money. There's a danger that people sort of get ahead of themselves, and there's a big debate about how we divide the proceeds of, uh, of all of, of, well, proceeds of growth. And the economy might be growing, but how we uh, divide up all of the extra money when we still don't have any extra money, we're just less indebted than we were. So we have to be careful not to get completely ahead of ourselves. But I think there also there does need to be a more persuasive narrative than just paying the bills. There needs to be a sort of sense of what type of Britain will emerge from the economic rubble. And I think parties show a sort of fortitude in terms of getting the job done and paying back the debts, but are able to point to something a bit more inspirational and aspirational than 
than just five more years of hard toil, uh, will be well placed to capture the national mood. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, there's a reason why they're divided into six and not to five, which is to say that the categories are, as I said at the start, different enough from one another to be meaningful. Now, that's not to say that, that some of them don't share a common critique of there being a lack of vision. Yeah, but the idea that there's a lack of vision in British politics is not confined to any one of those people. I imagine, <laughs> that, I imagine if you asked any of those, they'd say the same thing. I, the, the difference being, I mean, the calm persistence people, I think they are, yeah, they're resilient. They're kind of, they're kind of keep buggering on, if you like. They get, they're getting on with their lives. They understand the need for what's been done, but at the same time, you know, they, they need concrete proof that it's working. As you will know, across the broad board from talking to people on the doorstep, you know, living costs is a perennial issue, pretty much no matter which um, voter you're, you're sort of speaking to. The difference between hard-pressed anxiety and long-term despair is that hard-pressed anxiety likes or, or, or wants, because it's a vital part of their security, to know that there is fairness in the distribution of benefits and, and access to public services. Yeah, they rely on public services. They are probably um, yeah, they're the ones who've relied on sort of tax credits, for instance, and have been hard hit by their withdrawal. Long-term despair is much more. They're completely dependent on the welfare state in every conceivable way. But I think I think yeah, Jeremy is right, and this is this is it's a challenge to Liberal Democrats. It's also obviously a challenge to the Tories. Is yeah, what's the forward offer? How when you're stitching together these. The, this, the coalition that you need to to win the next election or to do well in the next election. What are you offering in terms of your proposition for sharing in the proceeds of recovery? Which for the Tories doesn't just mean well you're just going to benefit your rich mates again, aren't you? And the opportunity I, I would suggest for the Liberal Democrats lies in the fact that actually the Conservatives, hard as they try and some try harder than others, frankly, I'm allowed to say that as a Tory, I think, um, are, are seen as the party of the rich. You guys are not. So you are in a much better position, starting point, than the Conservatives to construct a narrative or a vision that's based on the fairer sharing out yeah. of the proceeds yeah. of recovery. And that ought to be your starting point. Yeah. I love Yes It Hurt, Yes It Worked. That shows that Rick's about the same age as yeah, yeah. the nostalgia for the 1997 general election. <laughs> and the last person who tried to make that argument got cream. <laughs> Michael Heseltine, yeah, yeah. I'll invite him, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jumping over there. Thanks very much. Well, I come from the other end of Somerset than Jeremy. So, interesting perspective that you gave on the county council elections, because having stood there against the UKIP candidate, managed to splash his face all over the front of the Daily Mirror. Um, he that actually, one? Um, oh, yeah, I'll explore it here, more with the, uh, the, the, shall we say, unfortunate hand gesture. Um, mm. Yeah, <laughs> that one. Um, he got a disproportionate amount of publicity out of that, um, which, funnily enough, he took from our vote, not from the Tory vote, which basically stayed the same. So that, that's one issue. I think, as, as, a, as a, a district councillor and a town councillor in North East, in, in the Froome area, um, uh, so the men area of Somerset, what I'm finding very interesting is straight after the elections in 2010, we were about as you know, popular as a bad smell. Um, but what I've found over the last three years is actually that has turned now to be a grudging respect for the fact that we actually accepted going into a coalition when as a nat our natural state as a party was been the party of protest, mm -hmm. but that we stood up to be counted. And what's happening now is, is I'm certainly finding with our counsellings, we, we are, the, the, that grudging respect is, is, is turning into a, yeah, okay, you, you can cope in government, almost turning round now to people are back to being willing to vote for us again rather than slam the door in your face. So I, th I think we, we have turned the corner, but I think, I think you made the point there that that's absolutely right. We need to clearly identify where we're going from now um, rather than what I think we're doing at the moment, just saying, well, yeah, well, we might go with the Tories again, we might go with Labour. I'm not saying we should identify one party or another, but we need as a party to clearly identify where we're going now rather than leave it to the last minute. And I, and the grudging respect is not showing in opinion polls, really, or not headline what you mean in, in figures. Yeah. In terms, well, we don't well, like us anyway. Well, it, but the, but the, I suppose to be uh, many of them, many of them don't, are unfair, and there are quite a lot of newspaper columnists who 
wrote with the coalition but only last a month and after a month said it would only last three months and after three months it would only last six months and after six months it would only last who have yet to offer their resignation for persistently misleading their readers in a way that a politician wouldn't feel comfortable about doing. But that's, uh, leave that to one side, you know, they have to answer for themselves. I just meant the, the headline polls, um, uh, which are done by polling companies, published by newspapers, but uh, done by independent polling companies, um, you know, do not yet show that change in, in attitude towards the Lib Dems, but I detect it sort of anecdotally you know, on the doorstep as well. And, um, and uh, you know, the last general election, uh, people uh, frequently said, yeah, people who are engaged in politics, obviously, you know, I've got my fair share of people who, are, who are, were said un, uncharitable and unkind things and others who were uh, much nicer than they needed to be. But the people who were sort of, you know, gave me a sort of analysis, if you like, a lot of them said, you know, I'm well disposed towards um, towards you or as my local MP or the Lib Dems. I like, you know, I like a lot of your policies and I like, you know, Nick Clogan. But I'm not sure I'm going to vote for you because for me, this is there's a sort of binary choice and, uh, you know, it comes down to do you want Gordon Brown as Prime Minister or don't you? And the alternative is the Conservatives. And sadly for you, Jeremy, they said, you know, you don't represent either of the realistic choices for government. Um, and I feel I need to make a national choice about the government of our country because we're borrowing 450 million pounds a day and we need to grasp the nettle. Um, and they went on to say, even if you were by some extraordinary chance to be in government, and you've never been in government in my parents' lifetime, so I can't quite visualise it, but were you to be in government, I'm a bit worried about whether you have the necessary backbone to make hard-headed decisions about economic recovery uh, or other great matters of state. And it's a shame because I voted for you last time, Jeremy, or I voted for you, and always voted for you in the local election. But and logically, it seems to me, we should be in a better position in 2015 to address the, uh, the concerns that, that that voter had than we were in 2010, because we have demonstrated emphatically that all of his or her concerns uh, were without foundation. But we have to have a bit of sort of confidence in ourselves. I've said this a few times as a sort of conference, so there's a bit I hadn't quit myself in the papers a day or two ago. But you know, I said that the task for us as a party gathering for our conference is to ask ourselves, are we proud of our government or are we ashamed of it? And we must, in my view, be proud of the government of which we are a part. And we need to sell the proposition that is the government to people rather than feeling bashful about it. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have our own distinctive forward offer, because we should, and our own distinctive manifesto, because we should. But I think uh, we, uh, we shouldn't uh, equivocate when it comes to the role that we've played in, um, in, uh, in the sort of gradual national recovery. Because if we don't, uh, if we don't associate ourselves with those achievements, then we don't deserve to be associated with them by other people. We've got time for a few more questions before Jeremy has to rush off to the important debate this morning. Gentlemen, we have to finish that. Thank you, Charles Mayor, Sunshine County Council. We have no UKIP councillors, and in fact, we have no other party apart from three main ones. Um, but both the differential turnout has always been key to winning any election, whether we're at local or national level. There was a drop in turnout across the spectrum in the county elections. Whether that's going to be replicated again, you know, it's only been dropping in general elections since the 1950s, one or two little peaks, but it's going to be dropping. How does one get back those voters who think, well, actually, well, they're going to be the same in terms of, you know, the recovery is still debt, there's still going to be cuts, are still, and the same is going to be for the coalition, you know, and you can only offer a different version of that, it's a completely different perspective. So there is a danger there that some people might be attracted. Actually, it's like radically different. We don't really know what it is, but it's not more cuts. Mm. And I think that's a danger for us all. It's, it's only people who haven't voted, you, as the lady here said, turn out to vote in some, in some areas, take perspective from all three parties, mm. and therefore can leapfrog to first place. Particularly in county, maps, no, maybe mm. not so in a general election position, but if you look at the county results in some places like um, Great Yarmouth, in theory, they could win two parliamentary seats. Well, I mean, it'll turn out. Right. And the difficulty, I mean, just to bring another say, there, there are longer term trends. I, I think, um, uh, well, I, I'd like more people to vote in elections. I always vote in elections. I remember when I became 18, I was excited. And, uh, uh, maybe it's an unfashionable thing to admit that I was excited to be able to vote for the first time. So I was a great sort of rite of passage. But I think um, 
you know, people shouldn't take um, living in a democracy for granted. And there are billions of people around the world who uh, envy the opportunities that we have. I suppose the only, only point I would uh, make in a sort of um, observation about social trends is that a lot of people in, back in the 1950s voted, but they voted in a sort of automatic default way for the party uh, uh, that through social class uh, they felt <coughs> obliged to vote for. And so the impression was given of a much more engaged electorate. But you just had huge blocks of people going to vote for the Labour Party in Labour areas of the country, and huge blocks of people going to vote for Conservative and Conservative areas of the country. I don't know if it necessarily reflected a more energetic national debate or even greater political engagement by the people who were voting. And maybe there is a sort of vitality to our political debate today um, that is uh, stronger than it was when we just had these sort of two blocks that hardly had any... Uh, flow between them, between them at all. But how how we um, try and um, engage people is difficult for all parties, not least because there is there is an underlying message which is uh, which is you know it doesn't make the heart race, which is that we uh, have been spending more money than we can afford for a sustained period of time, and we need to balance the books. And that is almost the starting point of all the debate. And then after that, you need to try and put a vision on top of what sort of country you would look to build. And I, I, I think, you know, we, if you think there is discontent with politics now, I think there would be a serious issue if uh, Labour were to win uh, a clear overall majority uh, on the premise that the only reason that there were any reductions in any government spending was because the wicked coalition wanted to visit pain upon... Uh, undeserving people. It was all done through malice, not through necessity, which is essentially the Ed Miliband pitch. Mm -hmm. And then when he, when, if he were to become Prime Minister, uh, the logic would be, well, now you've got rid of all those uh, terrible people, you can turn the taps on full again, and we'll, we'll reverse all the cuts, and we'll treble all of this. And then there will be the terrible moment of pain, his sort of Francois Hollande plus, <laughs> when he has to explain that actually everything he's been saying for the last five years about the government budget reduction program uh, failed to mention a truth which was that you can't go on indefinitely spending more money than you have and uh, the next government is going to have to carry on reducing deficit because the deficit will not be uh, cleared by 2015 and that will be true whoever is in government and so there is that sort of backdrop of reality mm. that is a that is a constraining force on all of the political parties. So would you refuse to join a government no, with Labour? Not no, what I said. At all. <laughs> <laughs> so that's I said, I said whatever. What I, you know, the camera twitching there. <laughs> I um, is that I've got an opportunity to change yeah, yeah. the news agenda. I um, <laughs> I, 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 um no, it's uh, the um, we will take our marching orders from the British Brilliant. people. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Jeremy Brown, Rick Nye. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, enjoy conference. Thank you. Thank you.